Good morning, everybody. Happy Friday. Welcome to today's dose of scripture news and commentary. Today is June the 14th. The weekend approaches. It's almost here. This week, I've been talking about jurisdiction. And the fundamental question that I've asked and that I'm attempting to answer as we teach our way through it is this. When can I reverse the curse? And when can't I reverse the curse? Of course, I always have jurisdiction over the issues within my life, and through the power of Christ, I can reverse it for me, but it, but it becomes much more difficult when we talk about reversing the curse in other people's lives, because jurisdiction comes into play. Well, I'm going to begin to foray into jurisdiction within the family and the home, and this is going to extend into next week. And the reason that I'm doing this is because God's family order and the authority structure within the home is certainly under attack today. And so I think it warrants a, a biblical view. This is something that uh, God is going to be restoring in our society in days to come. And we're going to look at the biblical family order first. I'm, I'm going to have to spend today laying some biblical foundation for this. And then the discussion will extend into next week as I pick up with other videos. But I want to, I want to take a good hard look at some scripture today, make some comments to lay the foundation. Let's begin in Ephesians chapter 5. Here's Paul's instruction to men and to women within the family. In verse, uh, Ephesians 5 and verse 22, Paul says, Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in every thing. All right, Paul starts with the ladies. That's where things begin with getting the home in order. He starts with the wives and he tells them that they need to submit to their own husbands. But even though he starts with the wives, then he proceeds onward to the husbands. And you'll see that there's actually more instruction given to the husband, though he starts with the wife. Here's what he says to the men. In verse 25, he says, Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself, a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. For no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourisheth and cherisheth it, even as the Lord the church. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, and shall be joined unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh." Now he concludes the chapter with these words in verses 32 and 33. He says, this is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Nevertheless, let every one of you in particular so love his wife, even as himself, and the wife see that she reverence her husband. Paul says this, this issue of family order, family authority, the family unit according to God is a great mystery. And what he's pointing to is that how that the family structure and the family unit is, is an image of the relationship between Christ and his church. So if we want to understand the relationship of Christ and the church, we have to understand the relationship of husbands to wives, wives to husbands, uh, where the children come into play in that whole uh, scenario. And we need, to, we need to get those things right. Because if we can get those things right, it's going to help us gain spiritual insight into our relationship then to Christ. Because the church is, is the bride um, of Christ, so to speak. And so, 
whenever you talk about jurisdiction over the curse, you have to factor in this thing that I call alignment. And I'll do a, I'll do a series on alignment at some point. But you've got to talk about alignment within the order of things. The, this passage, even though it addresses wives and what their attitude is to be, and it addresses husbands and what their attitude is to be, this passage does not establish a tyrant and a slave in the household. It establishes right alignment under authority. You've got God at the top, and then you've got the husband who's directly accountable to God, and then you've got the wife who's directly accountable to the husband. Well, then under that, you would have the kids accountable to both parents. <clears throat> you see that in other passages where, where Paul is talking about family order in the, in the family unit. This is God's established order of accountability within the home. It's how the home is to be rightly aligned under headship, to be rightly aligned under God. Now, for the governing of the home, of the household, this is God's established pattern for delegated authority. You see, God extends his rule into the earth through delegated authority, not through direct authority. This pattern for the home extends all the way back even to the Garden of Eden. And so this is God's pre-curse design. And it persists into our day because it's reinforced here in the New Testament. We live in the New Testament era. And there are, there are some things that passed away that were under the Old Covenant. But this was not part of the Old Covenant. This was pre Old Covenant. This was pre-curse when Adam and Eve were even in the Garden of Eden. And God did not establish this order to punish anybody. He did it to establish his blessing. And, and as we flow with that, it breaks the curse in our homes. It will break the curse within society. It will break the curse over the earth, just getting the family unit right. And our response to delegated authority, God's delegated authority. Now, I want you to notice something. I want to go all the way back to the book of Genesis because this is, as I said, this is all precursed stuff. This is the precursor, no pun intended. But when you look at the creation back in the garden, it says, of course, that God created Adam and Adam was alone for a while before God created Eve. Well, before Eve came on the scene, I want you to notice something in verses 15 through 17. Eve is not around for this. It says that the Lord God took the man, that would be Adam, and he put him into the Garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. And the Lord commanded the man, that's Adam, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. I want you to notice that Eve was not on the scene when God commanded Adam not to partake of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Now, you see that down in verses 18 through 20, that Adam is still alone. It says that the Lord God said, It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make and help meet for him, or a, a help suitable for him. And so it says that out of the ground, the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every fowl of the air and brought them to Adam to see what he would call them. And whatsoever Adam called every living creature, that was the name thereof. <clears throat> and then Adam gave all the names to the cattle, to the fowls of the air, and to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a help meet for him. So we see that, that Adam is going about his business and, and he's alone at this point. So when God gave Adam the command to not eat of the tree up in verses 15 through 17, Adam is alone. He's going about his business. Eve is not on the scene. So, so when Eve comes along later on in the equation, when she is created from Adam's rib and the two become man and wife, it was Adam who told Eve not to eat of the tree. 
the reason for that is because Adam was God's delegated authority. God told Adam directly, and then Adam had to tell Eve because he was God's delegated authority to her. Okay? So again, bear in mind that God did not communicate those instructions directly to Eve. Now, I know that everybody knows this. Every man knows this and every woman knows this. If, if God directs the husband to do something and doesn't tell the wife directly, that can create tension within a home. Whenever God says something to one person and not to the other, you're then dealing not with direct authority, you're dealing with delegated authority. And that's where difficulties can come into play. Adam was God's delegated authority. God didn't communicate the instructions to not eat of the tree directly to Eve. Now, this is why when you get over into the next chapter, in Genesis chapter 3 and verse 1, this is why the devil said to Eve, hath God said. You see, it says here that the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And the serpent said to the woman, yea, hath God said, you shall not eat of every tree of the garden. Did God really say that? Well, why did the devil say that to Eve? Because she wasn't around to hear it from God's lips. She heard it through Adam's lips. So, so Satan is creating doubt in Eve's mind of God's delegated authority for the home. He couldn't have gotten away with this with Adam because Adam could have said, yep, he said that. I heard it directly from God himself. Eve couldn't say that. She heard it from Adam. So, so Satan is playing on that to create doubt in Eve's mind of God's delegated authority over the home. Now, when you think about this, this, this pattern is what made Adam's sin so egregious. You see, Eve always gets a bad rap. Every ta everybody talks about Eve eating of the apple. But, but understand that Eve rebelled against Adam. Her rebellion was against Adam. When Adam ate of the fruit, his rebellion was against God. He knew better because he'd heard God say, don't eat of the tree directly. So, so everybody gives Eve a bad rap. Really, it was Adam that caused the fall of man because he, he entered into rebellion, direct rebellion against God. And so Eve was deceived, but understand this, Adam was not. He knew what he was doing. And so in that, he committed high treason against God. And that then brought on the fall of man and subjected man to the dominion of Satan. And the curse came. And the curse now needs to be reversed. Well, I, I said earlier this week that there are two fundamental issues that contributed to the fall of man. One is the right response to authority. And the other is the right exercise of authority. Man has been struggling with both of those things for all of time. You have struggled with it. I have struggled with it. Every one of us have struggled with either the right response to authority or the right exercise of authority. If you get those things wrong, you enable the curse. If you get them right, you can reverse the curse. And see, part of reversing the curse is getting those things right. We really, need to, we, we really need to understand that that's one of the huge things that God is trying to work out in the human heart today. And these things are going to be set in order, and they're going to be, they're going to be correct when the kingdom age is us ushered in. There's going to be the right response to God's authority, not just God's direct authority, but also to God's delegated authority. And then there's also going to be the right exercise of authority. Again, God does not desire to establish tyrants and slaves. So, so we've got to learn the right response to authority today. And then we've got to learn the right exercise of authority. And one of the best ways, one of the best avenues in which we learn that is in the home, the family unit. Now, I'm going to expand on this next week, but again, today has been scriptural foundation for this discussion, so I just need to read one more passage for you. I know I'm running short on time, but I want to read one more passage, 
and it's found in the book of Numbers, chapter 30. This is not often talked about when it comes to talking about the family unit and authority within the home, but let's skim it really quickly, keep it in the back of your mind, and then we're going to get into it again next week. It says that Moses spake unto the heads of the tribes concerning the children of Israel, and he said, This is the thing which the Lord hath commanded. So this is a thus saith the Lord. If a man vow a vow unto the Lord, or swear an oath to bind his soul with a bond, he shall not break his word. He shall do according to all that proceedeth out of his mouth. If a woman also vow a vow unto the Lord, and bind herself by a bond, being in her father's house in her youth, so this would be an unmarried daughter, and her father hears her vow, and her bond wherewith she has bound her soul, and her father shall hold his peace at her then all her vows shall stand, and every bond wherewith she hath bound her soul shall stand. But if her father disallow her in the day that he heareth not any of her vows or of her bond wherewith she hath bound her soul shall stand, and the Lord shall forgive her or release her, because her father disallowed her. The father can nullify her vow." Well, this extends even to that of a wife. It says that if she had at all an husband when she vowed or uttered aught out of her own lips, wherewith she bound her soul and her husband heard it, and he holds his peace at her in the day in which he hears it, then her vow shall stand and her bonds wherewith she bound her soul shall stand. But if her husband disallowed her on the day that he heard it, then he shall make her vow which she vowed and that which she uttered with her lips wherewith she bound her soul of none effect and the Lord shall forgive her. It talks about her then being released. Well, then it goes into widows. It goes into women that are divorced as well. And it gives further instruction to them. And for the sake of time, I'm not going to go into that. I might expand on that Monday. But, but, this is an interesting passage for sure because it's, it's reestablishing the right response to authority, the right exercise of authority, and it's showing that there is a hierarchy of authority within the family unit. And as we get those things right, then God's blessings can flow and it will reverse the curse in your life and in your family today. Now, this is an interesting passage. As I said, I'm not going to continue reading all of it today, but I would just encourage you to read it over the course of the weekend here. Um, I'm sure it will provoke a lot of thought and discussion within your household. If your household is anything like mine, you'll end up talking about it because believe me, my wife and I have actually talked about this particular passage, what it means and what the implications are for us today. All right, well, that's some scriptural found, uh, groundwork for next week's further exploration into this subject matter of jurisdiction. When can I reverse the curse? And when can't I reverse the curse? We're answering that question. It's a complex question, but I trust you're finding this interesting and useful. We're going to apply that to the family and to the home beginning next week. Until then, I've got a new verse for you. It's found in Psalms 127 and verse 1, and this is what it says. Except the Lord build the house, they that build it labor in vain. All right, everybody, have a great weekend. Stand out.